Morning, everyone. I'd like to thank With a Slack for inviting me to do this presentation and uh, all of you for um, booking in and, and logging on. Um, I should explain I have quite a lot of slides on what is a pretty detailed subject, and any of you who've gone through all or part of this will be well aware of it. So it does mean it's going to be quite, a, it's basically going to be an overview of the EHC process uh, and a bit of a whistle stop tour and that means I won't necessarily be going through every line of the slides but they um, I believe they will be available afterwards if anyone wants to go through them in more detail and of course there's a lot of material which we as an organization produce and so do other people um, putting quite a lot more flesh on the bones. So just to dive in, just a quick look at where we find the law on this currently. And the current main bit of legislation is the Children and Families Act 2014, which sets the basic principles. And then you have, as it were, under that, the SEND regulations of 2014, which puts in quite a lot more detail around things like time limits and what happens in annual reviews and after tribunals and things. But be aware that that has been the subject of a few amendments subsequently so if you're looking at those regs just also google something like send regulations amendments but in fact i don't think the amendments really affect what i'm talking about today and those two bits of the law underneath that as it were is the code of practice um and note it's 2015 and um that I put that in bold because in many ways it's the most accessible and user friendly and the fullest, but it is just guidance. It is not the law. Um, it's, it's basically a, an explanation of the law. It expands on it quite a lot, but there is a lot in there which, as it explains, it refers to in terms of must. And it says that if it says must, it has taken it from the law, and therefore that is an explanation of the law. But over time, since 2015, there have been a few cases and so on which have established one or two errors and omissions in the code of practice. So be aware that if there's a conflict between the code and the law, as it were, the law always wins. I am not suggesting you print all of those off. Um, if you want to print anything off in terms of um, the what I'm talking about today is mostly chapter nine, which is all about the assessment and EHCP process and annual reviews. Um, but it's quite useful sometimes just to know where you can find these things. So you can basically go back to sources to check what you're being told. Um, I'm not going to throw too much law at you, but I just want to highlight this section, section 19 of the Children and the Families Act, which is the first section in the bit that deals with SEN. So it sets the overriding principles under which local authorities have to work. And the first three bits of those are all around listening to parents, listening to children, making sure that they can participate. And all of that's quite useful to quote if you feel you're not being listened to, if all your emails are being ignored, if you're not being called to meetings, that type of thing. And the last one, D, um, is one I'm, I find myself quoting quite often, is the need to support the child, young person, etc., to facilitate their development and to help them, them to achieve the best possible education and other outcomes. And this underlies a lot of what this system is about. You'll see an awful lot about outcomes throughout the process. And what it is saying to local authorities, I would always argue, is you must be ambitious for children and young people. You must, you, it's, not, it's not okay to say they've got learning difficulties, why bother? Um, it's you have to be ambitious. You have to help them to achieve to the best of their ability, and that is should be the focus throughout the process. If a child is identified with SEN at the age of sort of one, you should be focusing on that at least up to the age of 25, which is when potentially you go out of this system. I should say I talk about child and young person. The difference between a child and young person, the cutoff point, as it were, is when they achieve statutory school leaving age, which is the last Friday in June in the school year that they become 16. And the significance of that is that at that point, they, uh, they have the right to make these decisions themselves. All the, so that means they can ask for an EHC plan, they have to be consulted about drafts, they have to, the lead role, as it, or they can have the lead role in annual reviews. They have the right to appeal, provided that they have capacity. And that means the 
doesn't necessarily mean the sort of understanding of a lawyer, but at least enough understanding to to be able to to assimilate the information and make a decision based on it and know what it's about. If they don't have capacity, then it will go back to somebody else, usually the parent. And even if they are technically young people, there there is still a massive expectation that parents and carers will be very closely involved. So don't feel that you, you end up being completely sidelined when your child hits 16, because it's not necessarily the case. And if you have concerns about that, you can get them, if they agree to and they understand, to sign something saying, I want mum and dad to deal with this. Um, and then they're over 18, you can look at things like a power of attorney. Um, so the question is, why would you want an EHC plan? The sort of theory behind it is that it's meant to provide a document which gives, it's just in one not too long document, a nice, clear, accessible, complete, holistic summary of all the child's education related education, health and care needs and all the provision that's required to meet those needs. So um, it's, uh, there was a recognition that education doesn't really happen in a vacuum, particularly for children with SEN and disabilities. There are often health and social care needs that are connected and that it would be useful to have all of that in one document. Uh, and so it basically say you go into a school, you've got a teacher who's never met your child before. It's a document that roughly tells them what your child is about, what their difficulties are and what they should be doing to meet those difficulties without having to plow through, um, you know, six long reports. Another very practical reason for it is money. Um, if your child needs provision, which is over and above what is normally funded, for children with SEN in mainstream schools, which is basically um, the £4,000 a year notional funding for any child in school and the £6,000 a year for children with SEN. So if they need more than that, then the local authority has to fund it. I put in, a co in the slide a comment that there's no such thing as an unfunded EHCP because some local authorities say to parents, well, why bother? You know, you, we, we're not, we don't fund any of this. And it's nonsense. They have a statutory duty to ensure that your child receives all the support that's set out in the support section of the plan and they have to fund it. They do not have a choice. Uh, and so, um, that's the point that it really brings that one point that it brings in that funding for say that one-to-one -one teacher that therapy equipment even um you know the, the 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 cost of a special school or an independent special school and connected to that is the fact that it gives you enforceability of that provision as i said the local authority has got a statutory duty section 42 of the act uh, where it has to secure the provision that is in section F of the plan. And for what it's worth, the local um, health services have a duty to ensure that your child gets what's in section G, which is the health section, and social services by a slightly complicated route have a duty to ensure that they get what's in section H, which is the social care section. Um, the great thing about it is that it is enforceable. You, if they, you know, if you're dealing with this problem that things are not happening and you're getting lots of excuses, you can enforce that. And there are various ways of doing that. The main ways are by using the local authority complaints process and going ultimately to the education ombudsman, um, the, sorry, the local government ombudsman. Um, but that is a slow process. The one that we always recommend is judicial review. Um, where basically you are threatening to take the case to court in the child's name because you are talking about the child's rights and, um, and, and basically asking for an order that, uh, that, they, um, that they fulfill their duties. And it's a very effective threat, not least because if you had to take it to court and it's in your child's name, the very strong likelihood is that you will be, that your child will be entitled to legal aid. And therefore, local authorities know that you don't have any financial barriers. And um, we usually find, in fact, that simply the threat of judicial review is enough to bring them back into line if they're not doing, um, they're clearly not doing something which they should do. Um, I mean, I'm not, I don't have time really to go into the detail of that, but I've put a link 
there into some lots of information on our website about it. So before you start even the process of thinking about applying for an EHCP, um, I would strongly recommend that you keep a paper trail. And obviously that would include things like reports and important correspondence with schools and so on. Um, but other things like if you go to a meeting, we would always recommend to take somebody with you to, to take detailed notes, because even if there's someone taking official minutes, they never quite record what you think is important. So that person can then produce their own notes and their own minutes, or you can do it with them. If you can't do that, you're perfectly entitled to record the meeting. People have, there's a lot of myths around about this, but you are entitled under the Data Protection Act to record this sort of thing, provided it's solely for your use. You could not put that recording on, on Facebook or whatever, but uh, you could use it you know, quite legitimately because when you're taking part in the meeting, you want to take part. You don't want to be scribbling notes all the time, but you will forget an awful lot of what's said, so that may help you. And equally, if you have an important conversation with anyone like a teacher or whether it's on the phone or just in the corridors or whatever, if they've said something important that you do not want to get lost, then it is worth just sending them a, a brief email afterwards confirming it. It can be very informal. I just want to confirm what we agreed or I just want to confirm my understanding of what we said. And the important thing there is that people do forget. Um, but th this gives you a record of it. And if they didn't come back to you immediately saying that's nonsense, uh, then, you know, it's quite good evidence that it did. It was it did happen. And in general, for goodness sake, we always say keep a dialogue going. These are people who you are going to have to be working with for a long time. So, you know, um, you're, you're working together and it's ideally it needs to be a very cooperative, constructive process. So how to apply for an EAC needs assessment? Well, you can do it or the school, nursery, etc. can do it. Um, if you do it, you could do it simply by a letter. There's no defined format. A number of local authorities have their own forms or they actually nowadays tend to have online hubs. Um, that's legitimate, but local authorities can't insist on them being used. However, in general, I would say it would just saves argument to, to use it. Otherwise, you get arguments about when exactly the process started. Was it when you sent the letter in or was it when you sent their form in? Um, but I would say be fairly robust about that and don't be put off by lots and lots of detailed questions. They tend to ask questions about, you know, exactly what help is your child having, what progress have they made, etc. If it's things you don't know the answer to, just write in, please ask the school. Uh, they will be contacting the school anyway. So, um, you know, th there's a danger that people will think, oh, this is all too difficult. I I'm not going to bother. I'll leave it to the school. And the problem with the school doing it is that with the best will in the world, Senkos are very busy people and local authorities do tend to make them fill in sheaves and sheaves of forms. And not surprisingly, it keeps getting put back. And so, you know, they may be perfectly genuine they want to get on with this but they find it diff it can take weeks for them actually to do it whereas if you do it the advantage is that you know you know it's done and in particular you know exactly when the local authority received that document and that's important because all the dates in the timeline go from that date when they actually receive the document so send it by email or something which records that they have received it, records a special delivery. If you're doing it by hand, get a receipt. With that request, send copies of every relevant document. And I stress relevant. If your child is 14, there's probably no point sending them the report from the nursery when they were three, stuff that is relevant. But there is absolutely no advantage in holding anything back, make it complete. The one caveat I would say about doing it yourself is that an application which is sent by the school may have a better chance of being accepted because it shows they're supporting it. However, of course, there's nothing to stop them supporting it if you do the application, and it's worth probably having a chat about them beforehand anyway. So I mentioned all the time limits when they start, and it's all set out in a pretty diagram on page 154 of the Code of Practice. And every diagram starts from the day the local authority receives the request. So the first deadline is six weeks from the day they receive the request. At that point, all you are asking for is that they assess. And so they have to do, they have to decide 
whether they're going to assess within that six week period and tell you whether they're going to do that. If they then decide that they will assess, they carry on and do the assessment. The next deadline is at 16 weeks, when it, which is the deadline for them to tell you if they are not going to issue an EHCP. Note that's not. If they are going to issue an EHCP, they have to finalise it within 20 weeks. Um, and that means in practical terms, for what it's worth, that they need to send out a draft somewhere around week 15 to get through the processes in between. Um, but I wouldn't sort of worry too much about that. Now, those are statutory deadlines and they are important. They, they do slip and they shouldn't slip. And they can be in through that judicial process, review process that I'm talking about. I wouldn't necessarily be too gung-ho about it because, you know, if you're six weeks and two days uh, past um, when they, you sent the request in, you haven't heard about assessing. If you were to start sending in judicial review threats, there's a risk that you'll annoy a caseworker enough to think, you know what, the quickest way to get rid of this is to say no, which is not what you want. Um, I and mean, if you know they're going to say no anyway, if you've got a fair idea, then you might as well. But if you think there's a reasonable chance they'll agree, then start sort of politely before you start making threats. There are a few exceptions to the time limits, but they're very, very limited. It's basically if there's any problem in, in doing the assessment. So it's um, basically if they need information from the school during the summer holidays, effectively, that four week period when they're shut, or if there's exceptional personal circumstances affecting the child, like you know illness, bereavement, etc., or the child or the parent are absent from the local area for at least four weeks. And the sorts of excuses that we often hear local authorities coming up with, oh dear, we're short staffed, it's the summer holidays, or you know, your caseworkers on holiday, we haven't got enough educational psychologists, you know, none of those are valid exceptions in law. Uh, this is all that there is. Um, there is one other sort of semi-exception, which is that if they have initially refused to assess or refused to issue, at that point the clock stops and you have a right to appeal in both of those instances. If they then change their mind or if the tribunal orders them to assess or to issue, the clock starts again. So if they've refused to assess at six weeks, then two months later they change their minds, you are starting again at week 14. Sorry, at week six, you've got 14 weeks. They have 14 weeks left for the rest of the process. Um, and so that initial two, that in-between period of two months doesn't count against the, the deadlines. They do have a way when they start again to say, oh, good news, we've decided to assess. We've got 20 weeks now and they are wrong. So pull them up on that one. So what happens when they get the request to assess? Just running through, it's all fairly obvious of the sorts of things they should do. They should acknowledge you, tell you what they're going to do and what it will involve. They could should consult um, parents to get any more information that they might need. Certainly consult the school if they didn't make the request. And in general, they should support parents as much as possible, including, if necessary, giving them information in accessible formats. It might need to be translated. It might need to be large font for people with sight impairments, that type of thing. Give them time to prepare for meetings. Give them a decent chance in meetings to give their views. If they might need support from an advocate, they should consider arranging that. They should provide impartial information, advice and support. And they normally tend to do that by referring people to CENDIAS, which is the sort of the funded advice agency. And in general, any information that they obtain from the school and so on, they should share with parents. They should not be secrets. So what are the legal criteria when they're making this first decision? Are we going to assess or not? And it's set out in Section 36.8 of the Children and Families Act, which is a very valuable section, really. Uh, it is that the child has or may have SEM, or they may need provision through an EHCP. So that's a very low barrier. You're, you're not saying they've definitely got SEM. They're not saying they will definitely need an EHCP. You're just saying that it's a reasonable probability that they will. Um, in practice, we tend to find that if a local authority is going to refuse, it's not often for the first reason. You tends to be the case that when people ask, it's pretty clear that the child at least might have SEM. But where they tend to argue about is saying, well, yes, they got SEM, but look, 
you know, mm. school gets its notional six thousand pounds a year to fund your child's provision. Um, that should be enough to provide for your child's needs, and they never, we don't think foreseeably, they're going to need any more than that. Um, and so, it is quite important to know what are the criteria that they have to consider when they're thinking about issuing an EACP, even at this stage. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, I should say, when I talked about the £6,000 notionally, it's a figure that's bandied around a lot. Schools will always tell you correctly that it's never actually £6,000, and it's usually quite a lot less. There's a sort of a notional figure delegated to the school for all the children in the school with SEN, with an EHCP and without. And the idea is that they can use that for sort of economies of scale. So it may fund things like training for teachers and buying in software, buying in equipment, setting up the dyslexia group or, or the, you know, the, the um, social communication group, that type of thing. So you will never be realistically be able to demand to, 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 that they show to you how they spent six thousand pounds on your child, um, uh, because uh, among other things they don't get six thousand pounds, which is one of the reasons why uh, this is all quite problematic. So the, the code of practice um, expands a bit on the assessment criteria, and it says that the local authority must consider whether there is evidence that despite relevant and purposeful action to identify, assess and meet the child's SEN. They've not made a expected progress, taking into account a range of evidence particularly, and that's set out there. Uh, so it's obviously their academic attainment rate of progress and the nature and extent of their SEN. That business about purposeful action is important. So they're taking into account what schools already done. What have they done? Have they done everything they should have done? Has that worked? If not, why not? Um, uh, uh, you know, and if it's, if, you know, they've done everything that they sh could or should have done and this child is still not making progress, then that indicates that they need extra help. This fourth one is quite important. Evidence that where progress has been made is only as a result of much in additional intervention and support over and above what's usually provided. So this covers the sort of case where, this, yes, this child is making progress, but you have a school which is absolutely busting a gut and going above and beyond the call of duty to provide support, and in which case, you know, good for them, but the chances are it's not sustainable, particularly the way school budgets are at the moment, and they might have to withdraw that tomorrow. It's no guarantee it will continue. And it would also cover the sort of situation where your child's making progress because you, as a parent, are paying for, say, you know, tuition at home or, or speech therapy or something like that. And local authorities tend to fixate a bit on progress and say, what are you complaining about? Your child's making progress, go away. And the, if that's your situation, you need to emphasize this part of the code of practice and say, yes, they're making progress, but it's only because all this extra stuff is being put in. There's no guarantee that it can continue. I shouldn't have to be paying for it. Um, and so that's the only reason they're making progress. And the fifth bullet point is also important, that you are not just talking about academic attainment. Again, this is a problem we often see, think that assessment is refused because this child is keeping up academically. But actually, they've got other problems, which may be physical, might be sensory, emotional and social in particular, and, and also health needs. One the particular issue we see an awful lot of, especially since COVID, is children with anxiety and children who really struggle to get into school or who can't get into school. Uh, only yesterday I was talking to someone, the child, there's no chance of this child getting into school, but because he's doing well at home with online tuition, they're saying, well, he's keeping up, you know, he doesn't need an EHC plan, but clearly he does because he's, you know, he cannot access education without support. Uh, and I would say that provided that there is medical evidence to show that that a child is out of school or missing school due to anxiety. That's very strong evidence that they're likely to need an EHCP. So what is less than expected progress? Um, well, that's defined amongst other things in 617. And it's all in when in some ways it's different sides of the same coin, significantly lower than that appears from the same baseline, fails to match or better that child's previous rate of progress fails to close the attainment gap or widens the attainment gap. And again, that's quite important. It's not good enough to say that a child has made three months progress in two years if all their peers 
have made two years progress in two years. That attainment gap will be widening. And so that is what you need to be looking at when you're talking about progress. And if you want to highlight lack of progress in something like a request for assessment, if you possibly can, it can be awfully useful to put in a graph or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's the old thing of a picture uh, telling us, uh, saying a thousand words. It, it can illustrate it very clearly if, if a child's not making progress. So I said that you would have to sort of think about what are the criteria for issuing an EHCP if you want to show that your child might need one. Um, and so the base, basically what the Code of Practice says is that the local authority has to consider whether despite appropriate assessment and provision, the child is not progressing or is not progressing sufficiently well, taking into account whether the special educator educational provision required to meet their needs can reasonably be provided within the resources normally available in mainstream schools and then whether it might be necessary for them to get special educational provision under an EHCP. So that bit I put in bold is in bold deliberately. Uh, that's the main thing you're thinking about. Can this child's needs be met within the resources normally available in mainstream schools, if not, if it's something that it would have to buy in and have extra funding for or extra staffing, something like that, then the chances are this child is likely to need an EHCP. And that will that's one reason why it's important to see what the school's done already. You know, if they've done everything that they can within their resources already and your child's not making progress, that's good evidence. Um, a few round points around that. Local authorities mustn't use blanket criteria. We've come across things like they must be four years behind uh, in, in terms of their reading age. Well, no, uh, you know, you can't be as blanket as that. I'm part of anything else with a child's four years behind. That's pretty dreadful. But you might often you might have a child who's only two years behind, but they've got massive anxiety and speech problems. They've got to consider progress in every area, not just academic. It's not good enough to say they're making academic process progress if their speech and their anxiety and so on are still, you know, where they were three years ago. And when you're talking about the normal resources available to mainstream schools, that means resources available throughout the country. The fact that this particular school happens to have some spare resources that it's throwing at your child, or that your local authority has a pot of money called, often called a high needs funding process, is irrelevant because that's not available throughout the country. And after all, you might move to a different school or a different county uh, where that isn't available. And what you are saying essentially is that you need this guaranteed. Things like relying on the generosity of the school or the local authorities' high needs funding are not reliable. I was uh, just a little explanation about that here. Some local authorities offer it, and usually it's a process where a school can ask for some extra funding to support a child without going mm. through the HCP. And they will tell you rightly that it's good because it's quick. Um, but there's disadvantages to it. They don't do a full assessment, so they're not necessarily sure that they've covered everything that needs to be supported. And it's basically at the local authority's discretion. They can just take it away tomorrow. Usually they, they ask for the school to renew the application every year. So again, you might have it for this year, but it might be withdrawn next year. Um, so it's not necessarily a, you know an unalloyed benefit. But um, I, I'm not saying don't go for it because you know any help you know is is worth having. But one thing that's worth bearing in mind, if a local authority accepts that your child qualifies for high needs funding, they are saying this child needs resources beyond what's normally available in mainstream schools. And essentially they've accepted your child needs an EHCP. So my advice would be accept it, but carry on with your EHCP application because they might withdraw this funding tomorrow. There's a lot of myths around assessments. Um, and one of the big ones is that the school has to show that it's spending £6,000 a year. Um, I mean, that is relevant, clearly, because they have to show what they've been doing so far. But it's not cannot be an absolute criteria, not least because there's absolutely nothing in the actual regulations that says that. If Parliament intended this to be the criterion, we have to assume they've said so. Um, it could be that one reason they're not spending six hours a year is precisely because they haven't done an assessment. 
and so they don't really understand what the child's needs are. If you don't realize that a child has a complex speech problem or sensory problem, and you're not providing for it, you're not spending the money. Um, and some children, I'm afraid, don't get those resources spent on them because the school's in denial. This is all the parents making a fuss. Uh, and um, it would be quite wrong, really, that they should lose out both in not getting support and in getting an assessment purely because the school won't recognize the facts or hasn't been able to because they've done, not done an assessment. There's a few other myths which I won't go through in detail now, but there's all sorts of things which schools sometimes tell parents. Oh, we have to get an ed psych report first. No, they don't. That's that is called assessment. The local authority has to do that. I mean, nice if they will, but the trouble is you don't want that to delay things. Um, only if the child's needs are very secure, severe, only if it's an academic problem. Um, and we've had one or two instances with local authorities telling schools not to put applications in, which is completely unlawful. So, you know, bear in mind always those criteria in Section 36.8, those are the only criteria, and don't be put off by these myths. So, when they made their decision to assess, they got to write you within six weeks. If they're going to say no, they can tell you about your right to appeal. And I would always, virtually always, advise a parent to appeal because at this stage in particular it's a relatively easy process it's on paper so you won't have a hearing and over 90 percent of cases parents succeed either because the local authority concedes or they win the appeal and you would have heard no doubt about the current horrendous delays in the tribunal but i understand it doesn't apply to this sort of appeal because it's a paper process um, so what happens if they say, yes, we are going to assess? It's got to gather a lot of advice and information from various people who prescribed in the regulations. They are supposed to respond within six weeks and they should be given a copy of your request or the school's request and any reports that were sent with that request. And do note that what they have to provide is advice and information. They do not have to carry out a full assessment under these regulations. Um, it may well be that if they've never seen your child before, and I would strongly argue if they've never seen your child before, that they the only way they can provide any sensible advice and information is to do an assessment. But um, it's an argument we quite often see from local authorities. We don't have to arrange an assessment because, uh, you know, the, the, act, the regulations don't require us to. And it's, I suppose it's legitimate. If, if a speech therapist has been working with your child already, then they don't have to go back to the beginning. They know your child, they can produce a good report. Um, but sometimes this is a bit abused by local authorities to say, oh, well, we can just get our local authority to look at the reports and have a quick chat to the teachers and, uh, and that'll be enough. Um, I would argue it isn't, but um, it's quite difficult to argue. So who do they have to go to? Well, predictably, it's you and the school or equivalent if, if your child's out of school, someone like a tutor. Um, a healthcare is professional, which is identified by the responsible commissioning body. Basically, they write off to a central person to say, OK, what does health know about this kid? And I hope they will look them up in, on the computer and say, oh, look, yes, speech therapy is speech and language is involved. Or we'll get a report from them. Um, educational psychologists, they must get social care because this is an education, health and care plan. Uh, and um, I, I sort of put together F and H, although they're separate. That's why I put them in bold. Any other person the local authority thinks appropriate or anyone else that the parent or young person will, person reasonably requests that they get advice from. And that's all the others, the extras, as it were, which will depend on what your child's difficulties are. So it might be child and adolescent mental health services, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, physio, behavioural optometry, um, you know, if your child's got heart problems, it might be something to do with that, you know, uh, anything that is relevant to your child. And basically, I would argue that they should think this is appropriate if there's anything that flags up those difficulties. If this is a child who's too anxious to be at school, we should be looking at some sort of psychiatric report. If this is a child where someone is saying he's got massive sensory problems and is really sensitive to noise, then they should be thinking about an occupational therapist with a qualification in sensory so that they can get the right information. Um, and equally, if that's there's something that flags up that sort of problem, then it's reasonable for you to request it. But the trouble is that this is the big area where people have the most problems. 
Um, a lot of local authorities only go to an educational psychologist and nobody else. Um, and um, or they they operate a rule that they will only get reports from someone where where the child's already involved with that service. Um, or if they say they write off to the speech and language therapy service and they reply saying we've never heard of this child, they say okay that's fine. Um, uh, and it isn't fine. They're supposed to be getting in all the advice and information to make sure that they make a reliable decision. And if they do decide to issue an EHCP, they do their job properly in terms of making sure that it properly describes all of the child's difficulties and the provision that they're going to need to deal with it. Um, um, there's, we'll talk a, a little bit about what you can do uh, if they, they are refusing to do that. But just to finish off on here, the other bits they have to get is information on preparation for adulthood for young people beyond year nine. And if your child has a busy visual or hearing impairment, then advice from a specialist in that area. Uh, the exception to the rule about when they don't have to get advice and information is if it's already been provided and the person providing that advice, the local authority and the parent or young person are all satisfied that it's sufficient for the purposes of the EHCP. Um, and that's quite important. We sometimes get a case where a local authority will say, well, we're not going to get an, a speech and language therapy report because look, we had one four years ago and we think that's absolutely fine. And you, you can point out to them that no, you don't think a four year old report is absolutely fine. Um, and you know, clearly you need that to be updated, but it works the other way around. Sometimes parents have got their own reports and they don't really want the local authority to get their own person to assess. And you can't prevent that really, because you have to have the local authorities agreement that your report is sufficient uh, and they don't have to give reasons for it. Um, so what if they do refuse? Well, I, I don't really have any magic answers, I'm afraid. You can point out what Regulation 6 says. You could use their complaint system and take it to the Ombudsman. And in fact, I would tend to advise that you do that. Um, because uh, the downside of it is that it's too slow, to be honest. It probably is not going to resolve matters. It might possibly make the local authority rethink. Um, but it really needs to be registered as a, uh, you know, with local authorities and with the Ombudsman that they don't get away with this. You could point out to the local authority that if you have to go to the tribunal because they don't get the right reports, you will be asking the tribunal to order them to get the reports. And you can do that, provided that it doesn't cost the local authority anything extra. So you can do that for things like educational psychology, because they presumably got ed psychs in their employment, and equally things like speech and language and occupational therapy, because they've almost certainly got a service level agreement with the NHS, so it won't cost them any extra. Um, and so you can say to them, well, look, you're going to have to do it eventually through a tribunal, so why not do it now? Um, possibly get your own reports. Um, I think I go on, yes, to talk about whether that's uh, a good idea or not. Um, problem, of course, with that is that it's expensive and you have to time it quite carefully. Bear in mind, if you then pursue a complaint, you could ask the Ombudsman to repay you for that. But generally speaking, they're quite not very consistent in whether they will do that. And what they say is that they really need to see a lot of evidence that you really pestered the local authority at the time of assessment and they were reasonably refusing and that you you know you had good reason to pester them. Um, and then you have to stand a reasonable chance that that you might be repaid but do not rely on it. So Chris question people often ask should they get their own reports and the answer to that is well yes money no object is always going to be helpful but the problem is money good reports are expensive and they um, like everything else I think are going up. I used to think, think that speech and language therapy reports were, were cheaper, for instance, but I heard yesterday about a very good speech therapist who's just put their prices up to £1,900 for a report. And it's in a way they deserve it. It takes an awful lot of work, work to do. Um, but you have to bear in mind, if money is tight, uh, that you, you might have to time it. You Ideally, you need to go to an expert with tribunal experience, so they tend to be both popular and busy. Um, and because of that, they can take a long time. 
And the problem about the expense and so on is that they have a limited shelf life. Obviously, children develop, I would say, maybe a year, 18 months at most. Beyond that, it's getting quite riskery. And local authorities, I'm afraid, often ignore private reports. It's a nonsense that they do, but they will say things like, oh, they're just saying what you want to hear, which is not true. Uh, these are professionals, and in my experience, parents want to hear the truth. Um, but they do ignore those, and it would be quite grievous if you say you're at the assessment stage and you spend a fortune on getting reports, they're completely ignored. The time when a report is most useful is at the point when you've got an EHC plan and it's not a good quality plan because you, you can't get decent amendments into that plan without professional backing. And so it'd be really grievous if you spent thousands now and then by the time you get to the EHC plan, you're two years on and all your reports are, are out of date and no one's paid any attention to you at all. So you need to, if money is tight, you need to time it quite carefully. Maybe think about holding fire till you get to the EHCP stage or maybe in the early stages, if you're only going to get one and get an educational psychology report, that's likely to be the most valuable unless your child has a, you know, a really big presenting main difficulty like speech, in which case you go for a speech report. So if a local authority is deciding not to issue an EHC plan, it's got to tell you within 16 weeks. And again, it's got to give you notice of your right to appeal. Uh, if it decides to issue one, it's got to issue that, that draft to consult with you and schools and complete then within 20 weeks of when you first asked. So normally it's got to send that at least around week 15 because of what's got to happen next, because they have to give you 15 days to comment on the draft. That's 15 calendar days. And that's at least 15 days. So, you know, they shouldn't really stick to that necessarily. Um, and they've also got to give you that time to tell them your preference in terms of school placement. Um, and then it's got to consult the school you've nominated and any other schools they might be thinking of. And they've got to give them 15 days to respond. So if you think about it, if both of you take your full 15 days, that's already more than four weeks. So that shows you why it needs to be earlier than week 16. Um, what needs to go into a draft I will talk about incredibly quickly, but it's a whole sort of session on its own, really. Um, but what I would strongly recommend is that you, if there's going to put anything out of the Code of Practice, it's paragraph 9.69, um, possibly my favourite chapter, the paragraph, which is a big long chart. Um, which sets out what all the sections of an EHCP are and what should be in each section. And it's very useful to use that as a sort of checklist. It's not comprehensive, but it's a good starting point. Um, we do find that this is the, pro the point where if things are going to get delayed, it gets delayed here quite often because parents can get drawn into a sort of a game of ping pong, that they get a draft which is frequently, I'm afraid, quite poor quality. They spend a lot, they do a lot of work, uh, you know, pointing out everything that's wrong with it and all the things that have been left out and so on. And they send that back and they get a, a response from the local authority that, where they've made maybe two amendments. And so the local authority says, the parents say no and send it back again. And it's going back and forth, back and forth. And it's understandable that the parent is saying to themselves, look, I, you know, this is an important document, which it is. We need to get it right, which you do. But the trouble is that I think really if you can, if you're not getting reasonable responses and sensible responses from the local authority within, say, the first two drafts, uh, I, you, I think you possibly need to recognise you are not going to. Um, and you might as well say to them, look, you know, I've told you what's wrong with this. If you are not going to, put it right, then just finalise it as it is, and we will sort it out in the tribunal. I mean, it's very galling to have to do that, but, um, you know, it, it just cuts it short. But the thing is, if you keep leaving this to be dragged out, you're all that time, local authority doesn't have to do anything. They don't have to start supporting, putting that support in place until they finalise the EHCP. So even if it's inadequate support, it's presumably going to be better than nothing. 
Uh, and so you need them to finalise it um, so you can just get on. There is, of course, nothing to stop you carrying on talking to them and negotiating whilst you do an appeal or you might try during mediation. Um, and in fact, you know, tribunal loves you if you can carry on negotiating. Uh, but at least it, you know, it puts an end to the first stage of the process and it puts time limits on to what happens next. And one point to bear in mind, there's nothing that says parents have to sign the ECP or to agree it. We get parents sometimes saying, well, this is a dreadful draft and I'm just not going to sign it. Um, and you, you don't achieve anything by saying that because they can still finalise it. Uh, you know, there's, you not signing it really, they might use this as an excuse to drag things out longer, but that's all you will achieve. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole business of what to look out for in an EHCP because it's, you know, it's potentially a full day's webinar by itself. Um, Unfortunately, I've been a little bit more efficient than I expected to be by this stage, so I can expand a bit on this slide. Um, as you'll see in paragraph 969, there is a requirement that um, the EHCP has sections A through to K. Um, so it's a lot of sections. Um, one of the defects of the current law is that it doesn't necessarily have to have it in that order. It always makes me think a little bit about the um, Morecambe and Wise sketch about not having all the having all the right information in there, but not necessarily in the right order. And um, when this act was passed, uh, localism was the name of the game. They were terribly keen on every area having their own format of the EHCP, which frankly has proved chaos uh, ever since. Um, and it is universally pretty universally disliked. And what about the only thing in the green paper last year that everybody agreed on was that there should be a single format for EHCPs. But at the moment we're stuck with this. If you want to know what your what sort of the EHCPs in your area might look like, have a look on your local authority website. They should have a section called the local offer, which sets out everything about information um, uh, 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 about what's available for children with SEN and disabilities in that area. It doesn't have to be provisions in the area, but it could be provision outside the area that's available to children in the area. And that often includes information about how you apply for assessment and also about sometimes they will include a template. So you've at least got some idea of what's in there. Um, the format is reasonably logical. You have section A, which is uh, your contribution, the parents' and child's views and, and wishes and so on. Um, that doesn't have any sort of statutory force and some people take the view that you might as well ignore it. I don't necessarily agree. I, mean, I often find when I'm, I've never, you know, I'm asked for advice and I've never come across this family before and don't know about this child. I want a sort of a summary of, of, of what the issues are and I frequently find that section A tells me more than the rest of the EHCP. Um, so I would try to, you know, you'll, you'll be given something like a form and maybe questionnaire to fill that in and I would try to do that reasonably completely but not at massive length. No one is going to read through 50 pages but maybe two or three pages setting out not the whole history, but relevant history and things like, and the questions will point you to it, and so does paragraph 969, things like what do they find difficult, what don't, what do they find helps them, what do they like about school, what don't they like about school, some things about home circumstances, what do you want for the future, that type of thing. Um, section, uh, so after section A, you have sections which all deal with descriptions of um, the child's difficulties, so section B is education difficulties, section C is health difficulties, and section D is social care difficulties. Um, and I like to talk about those in terms of difficulties rather than needs, because um, the problem with needs is that when people are thinking about what goes into this, they see something in a report that says Johnny needs one-to-one -one support all the time, and they think, ah, that's needs, we'll put that in section B. And in fact, it isn't. That is saying what provision he should be having. 
and you want that in section F because otherwise it won't be enforceable. So it's better to think about it as a description of the difficulties. And section B is perhaps the most important one of this part because that's the description of the child's difficulties. And you want to make sure that it sets them all out and it describes them adequately. So it's not good enough just to do a little list of saying he's got ASD, he's got dyslexia, he's got speech problems, um, because that really tells no one anything. It should be describing particularly the severity. Um, you know, if, it, if it's a speech problem, it, it is a matter of just sort of, you know, struggling a, a bit occasionally over formulating a sentence, or is it a case that they're completely non-verbal, or is it that they struggle to just to, to take part in, in a discussion. Um, speech problems, you should be looking at both expressive and receptive speech. It's not just what can they say, but what can they understand. Um, and particularly with children, say, with autism and ADHD, you're looking at things like, do they understand inference? Um, do they understand jokes and sarcasm? And so on. So all of these things need to be described adequately. The things like literacy, it's really quite helpful to have some sort of issue, indication of what percentile they are on, i.e. how they compare with other children of, of the same age. If you're talking about first centile, that's a child or below, that's a child with quite major difficulties. If it's above 20, 30 percent, then they're probably somewhere around reasonably average ranges. Um, it's not necessarily helpful to put in test results because they've changed so quickly, but at least centiles are, are, are quite a good indication and there should have been a proper cognitive assessment, ideally. Um, C is the sort of health needs. Um, do note actually also that in section B a lot that you might think is self health needs should go into section B. So it's universally recognise that speech and language should go into B, even though provision might come from the health service, because communication underpins everything that happens in education. Uh, and um, uh, equally, things like sensory problems, which are to use very sensitive to noise, because they won't be concentrating and they will be easily distracted. Anxiety that keeps the child out of education. Those, I would argue, are all education difficulties and a lot that you might think is a health difficulty is capable of being an education difficulty. Um, and then C is social care difficulties. Whether that's, I, mean, I find that actually both C and D tend to be filled in very badly. Um, and whether that matters really depends on your child. I mean, we've a lot of parents take the view that they're not really interested in having social care help, particularly for younger children. And so they're not really bothered about Section D. And if that's your situation, then fine, I would ignore it. Um, however, particularly for older children uh, coming out to adulthood, I would think again about that because you should be starting to think about planning for adulthood. Um, if you think your child has social care difficulties um, and you've not had social care involvement before, I would strongly recommend asking the children's section of social services separately for a care assessment under the Children Act because that's really the way to get it done properly. So you have BCD describing difficulties. You then have section E, which is the outcomes. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it's important. So these are what you want to achieve as a result of the provision in section F. And I've actually put that, that thing about reflecting the benefits or difference likely, made, likely to be made as a result of interventions in section F comes from paragraph 966 of the Code of Practice, and that is important. People tend to put in vague, waffly outcomes, like, you know, he'll improve his reading, he'll improve his speech. And it's better to think about what do I, what are his difficulties? What provision does he need to meet those difficulties? What do I want to achieve as a result of that? And that what you want to achieve should be your outcomes. So he's got a speech problem. He needs speech therapy. We want him to be able to speak and complete sentences by the end of this key stage. That's your outcome. I mean, that's very simplistic, but that's sort of roughly it. And it's quite often to think of outcomes in quite purposeful terms. He will improve his reading so that he can access age appropriate texts. Um, he will uh, have um, received, he, he will have developed um, strategies to deal with sensory problems so that he's no longer so distracted he, he's, he's he can stay in the learn in the main classroom or something like that 
Um, so you then come to F, G and H, which is provision, and F is education provision, G is health provision, H is social care provision, um, and they should meet each and every one of those needs in the first section, so check for that. Um, and the really important thing about section F, and the thing we're always banging on about, is that it should be detailed and specific. Um, and the reason for that is partly so that people dealing with your child actually know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and um, also so that you can enforce it. If somebody comes to me for a, a judicial review letter saying, my child's not getting speech therapy and it's in their EHCP, can you do a pre-action letter? Um, if it says in the EHC plan, he will receive one hour a week uh, with a qualified speech a therapy, with a qualified speech and language therapist and a programme drawn up by the therapist who will train the teaching assistants who will administer it, I'm happy, I can enforce that, I can, you, know, you can identify if it's not happening. If it just says something like Johnny would benefit from some speech and language therapy input, I'm not happy <laughs> because that means nothing. It's just roughly saying, well, it might be nice. So look out for, I mean, we have our lists of weasel words, so do other people think that, that you want to look out for, things like would benefit from uh, access to as appropriate, might like to try um, regular, you know, regular might be once in 10 years, up to three hours, well, that might be two minutes, contacts with, I always dislike contacts with, he will have two contacts with a speech therapist, that might mean passing them in the corridor, so you want to try to get those pinned down. Uh, and so if you get every time you see would benefit from, change it to will have or will receive. Other things that might be more difficult to pin down, if it says something like he needs regular speech therapy, you will not get that put in. You might think that means once a week, but you will not get that put into the plan unless some professional is saying that it's needed, either an expert or possibly something like a teacher. Um, so that is why you the, the reports that the local authority get on assessment are important and that's why i said getting your own report might be particularly important when you get to the ehc plan because they're not they're highly unlikely to take it just from you they do need somebody to say that it's needed and they need it to explain it why and even though the local authority might not listen to private, might pay, pay attention to private reports. The tribunal will if they are good reports. So it is worth doing. And I should say, because people are no doubt screaming at the prospect of having to pay out that sort of money, um, that uh, it's, it's not much consolation. But if you qualify for legal aid, you might be able to get it paid for through legal aid. But your income would have to be really very, very low. And there are one or two charities that can help. Um, there's one called Parents in Need, but there's, there are others. Um, uh, uh, but again, you know, like all the charities, they're really stretched at the moment, so I wouldn't like to guarantee that they can. Um, so um, G is again sort of health provision, uh, H is social care provision. I don't really have time to go into those. Um, one point to look at with F is if you think you're going to have a fight about schools, um, it is helpful if there is provision in there that the school you want can do and the school the local authority is nominating can't. So if, for instance, you want a special school, you need provision in there of the, in section F, that a of, of the type that the special school provides. So it might well be something like saying he needs small classes, he needs a quiet environment, he needs specialist equipment, he needs therapists on site, things like that. Um, but again, it, you will only get it if it's been recommended, if, if it's been recommended by an expert, and they have explained why your child needs it. It's no good if they put it in because, oh, look, this parent wants this school, so therefore that's what I'm going to put into my report. They will have to explain why. And, you know, good, reputable experts, if they agree with you, um, will be able to do that. Um, the, the other bits of the plan are after H, um, you have I, which is the school, um, and that is another sort of slightly complex subject. The local authority has a duty to try to meet your preference in terms of schools, but it doesn't have to if it is not suitable or if it's not um, 
consistent with efficient education or the efficient use of resources and if they're going to refuse to name the school that you want it is most likely to be because of resources if the one you want is more expensive um, but they will may have to to name the more expensive school if the cheaper school cannot deliver what's in the EHCP. Um, uh, if your preference is for mainstream school, the law is biased in your favour. They have to name that school unless accepting your child would prejudice the efficient would be incompatible with the efficient education of other pupils, and there is absolutely nothing they can do to to remedy that. So this is sort of slightly biased advice in your favour and they have to consult the school they should consult them properly and they should consider those criteria when they're deciding what to uh, which school to name and then ultimately uh, if they possibly can meet your preference they should but they don't necessarily have to and then ultimately um, you know they, they will serve that on you and you will again have the right to appeal um, section J is information about personal budgets, if you have a personal budget, but that's really only if you want particular provision to, if you want to arrange particular provision or something like tuition at home yourself, and there's a whole set of complicated regulations about that. And then section K is the list of all the advice and information that they consider drawing up the EHCP. And the one pointer I would say on that is if you did have your own report, I would suggest that you aim to get them included because you want people to be reading those reports when they get the EHCP. So that is my very rushed um, summary of, of, of the whole process. Um, I hope you don't feel deluged with information. So I've put more information in the slides to fill in the gaps. And um, there's uh, um, little slide there which I won't go through in detail but it shows what we can do to help if you've got more questions notably that we do produce some booklets which put quite a lot of flesh on these bones um, and that's our begging bowl <laughs> so uh, I think I can wind up and, and go to questions if there are some Hi Eleanor, thanks so much for that was such a fantastic um, presentation which was you know just jam-packed with loads of information and um, some fab feedback coming in um, from everyone who's joined us this morning and lots of questions as well. Um, so I know that we, we've got this little sort of 10-15 minutes or so now and we'll just try and get through as many as we possibly can. Okay, so <clears throat> to begin with, if we have a child in a private nursery when is the best time to apply for an EHCP? That's a difficult one. I mean, notionally, you can apply for an EHCP from year zero, but the reality is that you need that information to back it up. And the chances are that the nursery can provide a lot if they agree with you. And you will want it to be in place, presumably, by the time you are applying for um, schools, particularly if you are staying in the maintained sector, or if you're moving to the maintained sector, rather. So you would, again, it rather depends what your child's needs are. I mean, sometimes for children with severe difficulties, this is obvious at age two, really, that they're going to need something like that. Local authorities tend to resist it a bit because they do have, tend to have quite a lot in place for early years. Um, and so they will say, well, you don't need an EHCP because, look, we've got the specialist nursery, we've got the portage service, we've got everything else in place. You don't need this. Um, but it might be worth starting the ball rolling. But in an ideal world, you are wanting that process to be finished or, or close to finished by the time they are four, presuming that they are going to go to school in the September when they're four. Um, and you have to time it because, you know, the process notionally takes uh, 20 weeks. Um, but if you end up having to appeal, it will clearly take longer. And as I mentioned in passing, I'm afraid at the moment the appeal system is dire. Um, apart from those appeals against refusal to assess, waiting lists are 11 months. Um, and, of course, that doesn't mean that, it, you know, you can't resolve an appeal in less than 11 months if you can get agreement with um, with a, a local authority, but it's not what it was a few years ago in happy days when appeals took about 14 weeks. Uh, so you have to factor these things in. Um, 
So it's a bit of a balancing act, how severe are your child's needs, how supportive is the local authority, how much evidence have you got, um, <laughs> timing it for schools. And particularly if you think your child's going to need a special school, you are going to need to start early. But there tends to be quite an assumption that in reception, practically any child can go in, which is probably tough luck on reception teachers, but something you might have to fight against. OK, thanks, Eleanor. Um, so the next question I've got here, any advice on how to get an emergency review? Um, yeah, this is for people who don't know about that is once you've got your EHCP, you have to have annual reviews um, once a year or should be slightly more frequent for younger children. But you, you can ask for an earlier review and it could be an emergency review. Uh, uh, and sometimes that is the best way if things, particularly if things are going ghastly wrong and they clearly need to, to something needs to be reviewed. And so it all rather, I'm afraid a lot of my question, my answer is going to be, it depends. Um, but if you are in that situation where things are going awfully wrong with your child's school, uh, it, it might, uh, you know, it's everything between the sort of disaster scenario where they're about to be permanently excluded or uh, they can't cope with going in or just the fact that they really are not making progress and they've not made any progress for, you know, months, if not years. Um, although if that's the situation, it ought to be picked up at ordinary annual reviews. Um, you can ask for that early review. The problem is that local authority doesn't have to do it. They have to do annual reviews, but they don't have to do emergency reviews. But I think what you need to be producing is evidence that things need to change for your child. And um, so it will be things like the evidence that they're making absolutely zero progress or they're constantly in detention or the school is telling you they're about to permanently exclude or um, they're just utterly miserable and you cannot get them into school. If, if you've got a problem about getting your child into school, medical evidence is really valuable. And I know it's not easy to get, but if you, even if you can get it from UDP, that will help to sort of say, well, this is going wrong. This is not the right provision for my child. We need to rethink. We might need to reassess. We need that assessment. Um, and if you've got, if it's not just you saying it, that's the ideal. If, if Certainly if your school agrees, fantastic. Uh, there's a very good chance it'll happen. But if there's anybody else, you know, people like CAMS or um, therapists who are working with your child outside school or that type of thing, um, but you know it's, it's the more evidence you can have the better and the more it comes from other people the better uh, but also things like evidence from your child's books and um, lessons from school and that time. okay thanks um on to our next question and um, so this person says that they've asked for an ehep plan for their son he's hypermobile and it really impacts him learning but the school have refused saying there's nothing wrong with them with him sorry is, have you got any advice here? That's not good. Um, it's, it's a situation that happens quite often. I think I would say um, carry on and, and, and do your own application, um, recognising that the school won't support you and therefore the local authority will almost certainly say no and you will have to appeal. But those are the hurdles you will have to jump. But again, get together all the evidence. Um, you presumably got medical reports on your child's hypermobility and evidence about how much pain it's causing him. If you're finding, say, you know, that he can't sleep, he's got trouble sleeping at home, um, and he's got trouble with mobility and things like that. And to show, you know, focus on this stuff, the business like he has, a, clearly he has a disability. Uh, assuming that that's all backed up by the medical reports. Uh, he's likely to need help and think about the sort of help that an EHCP would give. I'm, I'm taking it he might need things like help with mobilising, maybe, um, you know, help with, with pain relief, uh, with if it affects things like his wrists and hands, does he need help with writing and typing, um, <laughs> all sorts of things like that. Um, you will know know more about what the difficulties are and how they affect him. It may be that it's a situation where he actually needs provision that avoids stairs. Um, uh, you know, all of that is 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 
is important and it could be dealt with through an EHC plan. So everything you can put in that shows why he might need an EHC plan. And if there are other difficulties that may or may not be connected to the hypermobility, uh, if it's affecting things like his writing or reading or, uh, or indeed things like, you know, coordination in, in the playground and, and generally, you know, is he safe going up and down stairs, things like that. Um, put, put all of that in and, you know, really try to show that he is going to need an EHCP now, not least, because otherwise things will get worse and it'll all get much more expensive for them. That can be quite a useful argument. OK, thanks, Eleanor. I'm conscious that we've got five minutes or so left now, so we'll just try and squeeze in another couple of questions. Um, so this one says, my daughter goes to a private school and we currently fund a TA for her. Is there any point in applying for an EHCP assessment or is this something that will only help if she's in a government school? You, uh, theoretically, it could help, but there's all sorts of pitfalls, I'm afraid. I mean, the point is that if you get an EHCP, the chances are that it won't name the current school um, and it won't necessarily say that, they, that your daughter needs a TA. Um, cynically, I'm afraid I've seen some local authorities basically almost knee-jerk if refuse assessment for a child in a private school because they say to themselves, well, at least we won't be failing this child because these parents will carry on paying. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we've had a situation and you can sort of do deals with local authorities where the, once they've got an EHCP, even if the local authority thinks that a mainstream school is fine, you might just be able to do a deal with them whereby they stay in the private school, but the local authority kicks in what they would have paid for the provision in the mainstream placement. And that's not just the notional 4,000 plus 6,000, but also if they might have had to pay for that TA in the mainstream or they might have had to buy in extra therapies, that type of thing. Again, they don't have to do deals. Some local authorities point to a provision in the Act that says, if a child's in a school, um, you know, you, uh, if you name a private school, you've got to pay for everything in it. Um, we can't pay for other things. But the reality is that these deals are done. And some local authorities are quite pragmatic about it because they say to themselves, well, you know, um, it saves us. It's, we're not spending any more than we would spend if they were in the mainstream. And it saves us all the cost of a tribunal and so on. So we might as well go for it. So. Again, it slightly depends on how easy it's going to be and how obvious your, class, your child's difficulties are. But those are the sorts of factors that you need to take into account. OK, um, so last two questions now. Um, can you confirm if sensory needs should be put in section B rather than section C? I would strongly argue they should be in B. This is things like sensitivity to noise, touch, taste. Um, smells um, and so on and um, particularly things like noise are very central to the classroom because you know that child who's got super acute hearing is going to be distracted by the slightest pin drop almost <laughs> and so that's going to affect their learning or it becomes distressing if there's a lot of noise around you know it really makes children anxious if this noise is constantly coming at them um, and things like extra bright lights and things are going to affect their ability to learn. It may give them headaches and so on. Things like taste, perhaps slightly less so, um, uh, but, you know, that's only a minor point. Even things like touch can be quite important because that child who can't cope with the, the tie around their neck or the really restrictive school uniform, they might need provision to be in there that allows them to to have more relaxed clothing. So I would strongly argue, yeah, it should be in, in B and the provision should be in F. That's great. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so final question um, for today's session. So our school have said that they've used up all of their um, educational psychologist slots for this year. Um, so we're unable to get this report done before starting reception. Can you offer any advice on this situation? Um, well, not a lot you can do, really. Um, there's no obligation on schools to get educational psychology reports. In fact, you know, the point of this process is that the local authority gets that report after they've decided to assess. And if you need it beforehand and the school can't do it, um, there's not much you can do beyond 
either paying for it yourself or um, possibly could see if your your GP will will refer, but I suspect the answer is going to be no. I can't be terribly helpful on that one, I'm afraid. Okay, well, thanks so much, Ellen.